about why would a foreigner come to a craggy place and take away the little he had when they had more from where they came. That's part of what my dad remembered. So <clears throat> this gooselar sound, which we'll get more familiar with, this song that this man sang for hours, as I say, my father said, I remember it like yesterday. And all we had to do was make sure he had plenty of wine and plenty of bread for him to continue to tell that story. Now I've got a Quick quiz here. You can write it down, but what I'd really like to do is hear you say it because keeping up with the chat and also keeping a look on your, your faces as well, I would love to hear you. There's a big quiz, right? Don't say anything when I first ask the question. I'm going to do a little Jeopardy singing, okay? So just think. I, as, I, as I mentioned to Jill before this, I believe that, that those of you that are on this call probably write the books about the answer to this next question, this first question, but I still am bold enough to bring it to your attention. All right, think now. The language has been spoken for blank years. Think, do, 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 would know that I've already presented the answer to this maybe multiple times for them. What do you think the answer is, folks? 50. Okay, Nether. I don't know what this is. This, what are you this seeing, is language. Jill? This is, you, you mean language in general, right? Language in general, language that we can call language, the concept, the abstraction, which is more than just, Okay, oh, right away, oh, okay. Which is actually oh, like umbrella language. <laughs> language as a concept. Billions. Pardon? Millions, okay. Billions. Billions. Okay. There, I've heard people say a lot of, <laughs> however, <laughs> at least. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and pop this in here, knowing that the linguists in the room are like, yes, but, okay. There's always something. Generally speaking, we take a look at, it's 150,000 years for human language as we know it. I have pulled this specifically from John McWhorter and he does talk about the fact that there's of course conversation, but still this is 150,000 pretty much. Now, when you get to the next question, again, think a little bit, I'm gonna make a little Jeopardy like sound and we'll see what you think of the next answer. Language has been written, that is to say global umbrella, Language as a concept has been written for do 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 what do you say? Forty five hundred. Forty five hundred. Thank you. That was Gary. Any other verbal or chat guesses? 18,000. 18,000. And by the way, when I said guesses, I don't mean guesses. This is, group is way too erudite for sheer guessing. I understand you are, have all sorts of wonderful things that you're saying. Okay, I'm about to reveal. And Gary, I loved your, loved your thing there. What John McWhorter had specifically 6,000, but still more, although that's pretty accurate there between 4,500, 6,000, recognize the difference between the length of time of spoken and written is our real focus for the moment. Because when we're talking about epic and when we're talking about gooselars, we're talking about primarily spoken and it has an implication in the things that have been experienced that I think you'll find fascinating if you have not already perhaps written about it. So we've been singing and dancing stories all over cultures. I just grabbed a few cultures here and I just popped them here into the screen. But people that are here today in this presentation live are coming from cultures I know that have a singing and movement history of storytelling. So I'd like you to 
ponder over that, channel that, bring that back to yourself. Because part of what I love about the National Museum of Language, part of what I love about what we're doing together is people that love, as we said, the magic of language as the museum has on its banner. The, you have that magic. What is that magic behind you? And what over the breakfast table outside of maybe singing the Beverly Hillbilly song can you bring back? Gusle is the thing that I specified here for an anchor. Gusle is the musical instrument that was found. Thank you, National Museum of Language, for putting up a, a bill that had a guslar, that's the name of the person, guslari, plural, okay, on the invitation that was found on Twitter. It comes uh, historically from the root gosl, meaning fiber, which is what's in the bow. And it's uh, basically a, a, a droning violin, as we'll continue to hear. Now, I'm going to do something that I hope that you will understand I'm doing with a good sense of humor, okay? And that is that the bill has Cyrillic letters on it and it is specifically from Serbia, okay? The dinar, the money is dinar and it's from Serbia. And I looked at it and I just grinned because my father would be like, no, no, it needs to be Croatian money. <laughs> and when you look up, if you decide to follow things up, you will see people comment on YouTube about the origin and, uh, Generally speaking, Croatians don't think that they were the origin of Guslars and Gusle, but there is some fist fighting among the folks that have, so you can see why people split up after a while. So one of the sites that I have placed, again, in the items that you can look up is a UNESCO. So instead of me talking about this and so forth, let me give you a chance to experience. We're going to watch three minutes of this UNESCO, and he will refer to Serbia in this one. The first three minutes are a really good introduction. Let's take a look at it. Pevanje uz gusle, jednostavni gudački instrument, je drevni oblik izvođenja tekstova vezanih za istorijsko pamćenje jedne zajednice, koji danas predstavlja važan deo kulturnog identiteta mnogih stanovnika Srbije. Ova praksa podrazumeva interakciju izvođača i auditorijuma, a ambijent izvođenja ima elemente rituala, kroz koji se obezbeđuje kohezija i kontinuitet kolektiva. Reprezentativni repertoar Guslara čine pesme o mitskim i istorijskim junacima, kao i događajima iz legendarne prošlosti dalje i bliže istorije. A pored toga pevaju se i balade, šaljive pesme i mnoge druge. Tradicionalni stihovi su nerimovani deseterci, a najnovije autorske pesme su u rimovanim desetercima i osmercima. Muzička komponenta je ključno određena prisustvom instrumenta čija se konstrukcija i tehnika sviranja nisu suštinski menjali vekovima, kao i zakonitostima zglašavanja glasa i gusala. Tako je sačuvan arhaičan zvučni izraz. Bazirajući se na jednostavnom muzičkom kodu i univerzalnim epskim motivima, pevanje uz gusle je u prošlosti bilo prisutno kod različitih naroda na Balkanu. 
nekada ključni deo umetničko-kulturne prakse gorštačkog seoskog stanovništva, pevanje uz gusle je već dugo i deo kulturne prakse gradova. Gusle imaju četiri tona, zvuk sami se stvara na zategaču, priteže se i uz zategač se pravi intonacija za gusle, a gusla spravo svojih glasovnih mogućnosti određuje koji će to tonalitet biti. As a matter of fact, he's singing about Prince Casimir there at the very end. What do you think about the tone? Is that something you're familiar with? Something you have experienced? Something you play potentially? I'd love to hear. It's certainly a, a sound that I heard both in Cairo and in uh, Amman, Jordan, when I was in those places. In, in fact, I think that that style of instrument, in fact, I have one right above my head, a different shape, but it's still a single string played with a bow. And uh, I don't play it, but I look at it. <laughs> and it's, it's very familiar to me, the, the Middle East, I think. The Middle Eastern sound. Thank you so much, it, Gary. Anyone else? It reminds it reminds me of a Chinese arhu. The the arhu is a, a is a basically a gourd with a couple of strings attached. Uh, Gary Jill, you might have it, one of those too. <laughs> and Jill, does it have that drone sound too? The uh, the concept. Uh, I I. It has, a, it has a different tone. It's definitely, it's, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if it'd be described as a drone. But. Okay, anyone else? Well, I'm not familiar with the sound, but I have, you know, because I love to, to watch like movies and soap operas, those from, from Turkey or movies from those part of the world. But I'm not familiar at all. I'm trying to compare it to some of the instruments from Puerto Rico, but it does not match at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I'm familiar because I spent a lot of time in former Yugoslavia. So, of course, this is something that uh, you're always hearing about in some way and not that it's always performed. But it's interesting, uh, the, the, the words in the example that you had from UNESCO, uh, the themes of that, like it, it wasn't thunder, it wasn't this, it, you know, there wasn't the seas that were so loud and everything. That Those themes, those same themes show up in songs that are done, say, in Macedonia, which is where I mostly stayed. And uh, there they don't nest, they don't accompany them with an instrument, but they have singers. So that's they they get the drone through the drone part of the singing. So it accomplishes sort of the same goal, but it's done with multiple singers as opposed to a single person playing on an instrument. Thank you for sharing and that. That Catherine, the drone by the yeah. people. That's cool. Catherine so? Scott says there's something quite similar in Central Asia. She's That's experience. great. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate that. So, I, and notice also, we'll touch on this briefly, of course, today we're just doing a tiny bit, but the decasyllabic, the non-rhyming decasyllabic, historically speaking, we'll pay attention to that just a tiny bit today, and the more modern singers doing the decasyllabic and the eight-syllable <clears throat> lines more rhymed. So, I hope you'll enjoy some of the some of the uh, links that we have. Now, <clears throat> thank you, Michelle, also for sharing you know your experience of those that kind of sound specifically in Macedonia, and you notice that the the in the UNESCO he referred to a cultural heritage of the Balkans, indeed. And here's a I love this graphic. I just thought that all the colors were terrific, except that as you look at it with uh, your eye, I hope you'll celebrate it, but also try for a moment to look at it with my eye, because if you look at the map and just look at the little slice of Dalmatia, it's the only one that doesn't have any color in it. 
I'm not sure why it is we weren't considered part of the Balkan experience and specifically, but I'm okay with that because I have done several uh, graduate papers on these concepts and one of my bibliography persons specifically mentions, this person happens to be named Mr. Pearson, says, there is such a thing as a littoral society that is, we can go around the shores of an ocean, a sea, or indeed the whole world and identify societies that have more in common with other littoral societies than they do with their inland neighbors. And since we're gonna talk about Greek epic, haha, I go ahead and claim a little bit of Dalmatia for that. But seriously, the, the, the experience of the Gusle, the Guslar is more from the inland mountains area, but has played such a strong role across the whole of the Balkan area. And even though we don't have acute color there, it does include Dalmatia. And one of the folks that helped to make sure that the ongoing use of the Guslar tradition in Croatia is, was strong is Andreja Kacic Miosic. I think perhaps maybe every Dalmatian thinks they're related to Andreja and his uh, son, uh, Peter Kacic Miosic. My dad certainly thought our family was related to him. I don't know how, uh, but his Razgovor Ugodni Naroda Slavenskoy was uh, an inspiration, a history in verse, not sung originally, but an inspiration for Guslari to come in with Croatian stories on top of the more inland stories that have been told, although they were creating from the very beginning anyway. So uh, if you have a chance to take a look at, it's quite a long writing actually, this uh, Razgovor of Kacic Miosic, but um, he is, very well known and I, I'd like to introduce him to you as well. Uh, in order to discover how the Guslar tradition is related to the idea of the epic poetry and singing, the quintessential book up until, well, actually still, but Nevertheless, I, 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 it's, it's interesting today, I'll introduce you to something that you may have already noticed is out and been published, but it's the, the book here, Alfred Lord's The Singer of Tales. Um, Alfred Lord, uh, who died in 1991, okay, was with the uh, Department of Classical Studies at Harvard University. He was originally the assistant of Milman Parry, Milman Pari died in 1935 uh, at the age of 35 after a really sad accident uh, in which he uh, um, accidentally uh, fired a gun that hit him in the chest and killed him. And he had published in 1928 a study of Homeric verse that would break through with the concept of how it is that formula were appearing in Homeric verse and what the implications might be. And his breakthrough concept, having taken his, the Alfred Lord and a translator with him, went to the Balkans and found the man that along with other Guslari, that he considered to be the Balkan Homer, the Balkansky Homer, uh, Avdo Medjedovic, okay? So I'm actually going to show you just a couple of, of short items here, just continuing the sound, but also anchoring our understanding of the connection. And then when we get to the end of this particular part about Avdo, we're going to take that break and then we'll come back and we'll take a look at the epic aspects and some of the specific small elements. So hang in there with us because here comes um, Avdo Medvedevich's son. And one reason why I wanted to show you just a little excerpt of this is they are in the um, uh, Montenegrin hillside here in the former Yugoslavia in Montenegro. Okay, so he's leaning up against his house and playing. And again, this is Avdo's son 
who has carried on this tradition. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because I I do you each have your background. You each have those experiences where you've lived, the kind of music you listen to, the kind of storytelling you listen to. And so each one of us are having a reaction to things based on that history. If this, is, this kind of sound is brand new to you, you may find it fascinating and also a, a strange, or you may find it very compelling. For me, whenever I hear it, I relax. I'm ready to sit and listen to it and drink wine and think of other things while I'm listening. And I'm, I'm just really interested in, in the reactions as we continue to go through. Now, in Avdo himself, uh, you can see it with Milman Perry died in 1935. And it, uh, again, it was an, an accident. He was rushing back to the United States to help his mother-in-law. Uh, so Avdo was filmed though in 1935. So this is a rare piece of film of Avdo himself. And I just thought, that you would be fascinated seeing this goose <laughs> He could do that for three days straight. And he was recorded doing that, as we'll see in just a little bit. So when Alfred Lord, who finished the studies and published this in 1968, um, <clears throat> kept the work going of Milman Pari, and some of the connections you'll see uh, in the links that I provided that are in the chat or can be provided to you if you want to connect up with me directly are, are in still the Harvard Library. But to Alfred Lord, using the studies of Milman Pari, his singer of tales is Homer. The Guslari were helping Pari to uncover what he wanted to understand about Homer and the Homer, Homeric poems. So let's take a look together before we go on our break about a couple of things about Avdo Medjedjevic. First of all, as I mentioned, he's from modern day Montenegro. See how many lines he was able to dictate, that is to say, to sing and also to speak. 12,000 lines, over 12,000 lines, over 13,000 lines. All memorized, as we know. Here's an important part. Avdo would sing songs he already knew, but Milman Pari, being an excellent researcher, would also bring in singers and set them in front of Avdo and himself and have them sing a new song and then send the, the, the person out and Avdo would re-sing that story having heard it just once. Just checking. And you can hear, and <laughs> I promise I won't play all of them, but you can hear those recordings the nine discs of recordings, as well as others from his dictation, again, all found still at the Harvard University. Now, in this 
uh, Center for Hellenic Studies, and I've got, you can see on the current screen down below that I can connect to the study, and I, I will do that after I introduce this part. Chapter four of the series of the Hellenic study book that, that I'll show you here in a minute of epic singers and oral tradition, the fourth chapter is on Avdo Medjevic. And here are some aspects of it that I think you will find interesting as we continue today. You notice that some of the words that I really wanted to call your attention to because we can look at the mechanics of Guslar, the Guslar tradition. We can take a look at the, the instrument. We can take a look at the, the syllabic. And if you look at this, the singer of tales, you will see much, much detail about the specific lines, the parsing and the uh, working with the poetic breakdown. But the, I wanted to make sure that we also took a look at high moral tone, okay? He had pride in when Montenegro was part of an empire that had strength and glory, yet was not militant or chauvinistic about it. There's a poignancy in the singing. This is part of the bardic tradition, the Guslare tradition. He knew that things were passing or were past. He knew of the history that would never repeat. He was proud of it, able to celebrate it, and also to be realistic that it was not going to come back as he was singing and to bring that out without bitterness. more that they were morally strong rather than strong in arms and bringing in the sensitivity, the empathy. And part of the reason why Pari kept recording and recording Avdo Medjevic was not only his amazing skill in remembering, but also his ability to bring in these emotions to embellish this story, not with falsehoods, but with a clear visuals that help to create the story alive in front of people as they were listening. So you can take a look at this particular chapter. I'll show you this real quick, and then we'll take a little bit of a break indeed. But here is the, um, the chapter in the Center for Hellenic Studies. So I hope that Potentially you will enjoy going and taking a look at some of these items if these things are of interest to you. When we come back from our break, we're going to take a look at three key aspects of what ties the Guslar tradition to Greek epics. And we're gonna talk about what happened to Homer. I told you there was gonna be a spoiler today. So watch out. Got to come back after the break. Don't, 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 don't fail. Okay. We're going to talk about moods. We're going to talk about the rich, rich persistence. And we're going to talk about embellishments as the three aspects. So Jill, I don't okay. know if you want to call a break now. Yep. Let's go back. What's our timing? Yeah, it's uh, okay. 55. So Shall we say um, just after the top of the hour, we'll come back about five minutes. And uh, Greg had one question, which maybe you could think about uh, your answer to during the, the break, uh, okay. Nora. Great. Uh, his question is the Guslar is one string only. Is there any significance to it being just one string? Okay, thank you very much. I will think about that fascinating thing and. I will stop sharing my screen so I can quick find out. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. Okay, let me pause. Nora, if you want. Sure, I we can go ahead if that's uh, what Listen. you like. And I think I'd start by addressing uh, Greg's question about the gooselar being one string only, is there any significance to being one string? I think that there's probably, from what I can find and from what I've understood in my own background, is that it's not, uh, it, it, it's a single string more because it 
although the UNESCO video in particular makes the important point that the correspondence of the voice to the sound of the goose, goosle is an important aspect of practice and talent. Later on in that video shows a father teaching his young son how to strum the goosle and sing to it, that it's accessible with practice. I think that that accessibility is part of it. In addition, one thing that I had not remembered, but that provides for an, an aspect, I think, of the tonality is that the traditional way of creating that single string is to braid together 30, that's three zero horse hairs. So there's actually a, uh, the tonality is more, provides more depth. So I think there's an ease of playing, uh, the tonality of the braiding together of the, um, of the horse hairs. And then we have uh, Laura, what did you have here? Remember the chanting of the Pueblo Indians, that's very cool. So, so Greg, specifically to the aspect though of the single string, I think it has more to do with the accessibility for it being an instrument that can be easily picked up and used uh, with, some, with some practice for that chant sound. And I, I, if I find anything different, I think we should report on it. I would yeah. think that uh, the single string, like you said, would be good for if type of thing, a tradition that they want to, uh, if they want to keep it going, you want an instrument that would be easy to, to use. And one string would, would, would fit the belt. So I, I think that that's probably true. And I was, look, we were looking there, thank you. And looking in the chat and seeing that Catherine had written the single string shows also up in the Chinese arhu. Mm -hmm. You know, Oh, and there's, Gary said that they had two. And Louis has here, I wonder if the new generations learn to make and play the instrument at home taught by their parents, ancestors, or school. Actually, it's a little bit of everything. I'm sure that in many cases, it's kind of like a father to son. And again, the UNESCO shows this as well, that women are more, in, that's not traditional that women would be the singers. Um, but because, well, just because, but they, they are doing so more now. Definitely, you can imagine if I had spent more than just the summer that with my, with my family there, I would have had a chance during the longer winter uh, sitting in the homes, been able to listen to more Gusslar playing and probably watched uh, men and, and boys in particular that were learning. And yes, there are heritage schools I, that do teach this, uh, the Gooslar tradition, absolutely. Did you ever try and learn how to play it? Uh, thank you for asking that. I do have, as I say, a full, a full length one and I have tried strumming on it. And then uh, the, uh, the horse hairs on the, or the, yeah, the horse hairs on the bow snapped and I didn't fix them. Thus ended my musical career. Yet uh, you'd have to find someone who could, who could, uh, you know, who who's, who specializes in repairing that type of a uh, musical instrument. It might not be that easy. I, I would suspect not, certainly not to get the true tone. And just as an aside, and I know that there are so many here today with, with varieties of heritages that lived, experienced, is that my father, the, I was planning on packing like all the piles of wood stuff because the heritage of the Gusla in Dalmatia was part of the heritage of the complete sense of it as being in, in Yugoslavia. So there was an Eastern turn. When Yugoslavia split up, Dalmatia turned much more towards the West. It's always been part, part turned toward Italy. After all, where my father's village is, that Dubrovnik split, that was all part of the Venetian Republic. Dubrovnik originally called Ragusa. And the, so the turn away from the wooden things, the goosele, and even heartbreaking as it is. So when I go and to take a lot of the things that we had, there's too much for a family's inheritance. I look to uh, take the goosele with me 
Greg, and to see whether or not there's someone that can help to repair it or to, to work with it in some way. So really neat questions, thank you. Thank you. I would like to give you just a flavor of some things as you're looking at the screen now. Again, I mentioned about the mood and I'm going to let these play a little bit, but I'll also uh, put a, a stop them periodically so we can take a look at some aspects together. So first of all, remembering my father's experience of us sitting happily at the beach in Divna listening, here's uh, the mood set. This are from the recordings from Milman Perry. So as it gets started, I'm gonna set the scene a little bit for you. You can go and on YouTube, I've got those links for all of these things and more. You can let it play. I just happened to get them started at specific spots of this hour and 24 minute recording uh, that are from the Harvard recording library of Milman Pari's work. So this happens to be the player here is Salih Ulyanin. And so this is the captivity of Dulic Ibrahim or uh, Abraham Dulic. But take a look at, and of course, if you can read, Laz Michelle, I can, and others, if you can read the, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, Slavic, great. But uh, especially then you take a look at the mood of the English while well, I let it play a little bit. <laughs> So I love the mood here and I wanted it's it's interesting to, to me to follow along with because the singer they can recite the words and did for Milman Perry and for the translator and for Alfred Lord. But when they're singing it, I find it, despite knowing the languages, that to be a little interesting to go find those words. But the mood here, isn't it lovely? Let's all sit, let's all listen. And here's hoping things go better for us. And here's how it went in the past. Now listen to a story about a man named Jed. Only we can sit for hours. Do you have any response to that by any chance? Well, in my personal opinion, I think that culture plays an important role while listening to this here, because my mood is quite opposite to your mood. I don't know, probably because of the language or because it's a new sound for me, but for me, it sounds like strategy and sadness. Do you believe it? Interesting, see? So it's good to know that the mood here is potentially lighter than might interpret by the, by the sound. Is, am I interpreting you correctly? When we take a look at, the next thing I would like us to take I, I a look at. I wanna comment on that, uh, actually. Um, please, please. What Luis was saying. That was my impression too. And maybe it has something to do with it being in a minor. Is it a minor key? It is, it is. And, and culturally we associate minor keys with something dark or sad, right? It, it mm. didn't sound happy to me, <laughs> I, I agree. Isn't that interesting? Well, and he, the thing is, I'm going back to for just a sec, uh, just to, uh, I'll put in a pause, although your comment about the sound probably means I should let it play again, but let us make merry indeed. But the, look at, we get the cannon roared in Zadar. 
and the black earth began to tremble. So we may be making merry, but per your minor key, <laughs> the melancholic wrote Dali, yes. That minor key is creating melancholy. No question. You know, the facial expressions and the mood of the singer, I think too, would tell a lot about how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can sing a happy song, but if you're not happy when you're singing it, that's reflected in your, you know, you can tell that in the person. An interesting comment, Greg, because one of the things that I, we notice is when, for example, the ones that were demonstrating on the UNESCO are pretty standard. You can see a lot of these guys recorded. There's very little facial expression that goes along with this. They, when the singers sing, they're pretty much pan, their, their faces are stable. They're not emoting a lot during the singing. It's like they are, not like, it is, that they are the vehicle for the story, but that they are not providing, if you will, the commentary by their facial expressions. They use the drone, they use their memory, and they use the story as it's being recited, but they're not providing a happy note, sad note, angry note with their faces. I'm so glad that you pointed out that particular aspect because I hadn't thought about the fact that the facial changes, they don't, they just doesn't change. And Catherine, you make such a nice comment here. Major and minor keys are a concept tied to Western music with scales. Indeed, there is a, a sense of that storytelling um, in the what we consider to be that minor key, I think in cultures, but that we, approach in a separate way. I'd like you to take a look at the next concept because the next concept is actually the basis for which Milman Perry went to the Balkans initially. I mentioned back earlier. Namely, he found that the things that made me laugh as a teen, rosy fingered Dawn, gray eyed Athena, okay, that those elements seemed, well, to my teenage <clears throat> brain, fairly goofy. But in fact, yes, I think so. Your tropical country, definitely. This is, hey, this is Middle Eastern folks, right? Okay, oh, thank you, Catherine, for being here for the while. The Middle Eastern folks, the idea is that, I think that there's a sense of, I need to feel tragic half the time anyway. Certainly in the Balkans, there is, okay? So we will let that ride for the moment. But what Milman Perry noticed was, it wasn't so much that these were content areas as functions. The function of being able to remember. So the idea is that he called them formulae, not surprisingly. And in the Croatian, they're called rich or the, the Slavic uh, of Yugoslavia. They're called rich, which. <laughs> I, I'd like you to listen to this guy just a little bit. I'm going to let it run as you take a look at probably the English side. Take a look at what's being said here. Take a look at what's happening at the content for a moment. And also listen to his breathing and how he's anchoring his thinking, not only with the words that are coming out, but also with the time he's taking to take that breath. Listen for a little while. And again, watch the content on the right-hand side and because we're about to play something that was recorded 17 years later. He's actually not only breathing, but making a droning sound before he starts the words which is helping to anchor his memory on what comes next. We 
we pause to remind ourselves what comes next. So when I go and I go from where he recorded this in 1934, and then here comes a 1951 version by the same. <laughs> And I'm wondering if he even takes a little bit shorter breath and time droning at the start because he's sung it so many times since then. But the persistence of the content is not in the, it doesn't sound like rosy finger dawn to us because we haven't heard enough of this story, but the broad back chestnut horse you see about the fifth line up okay neither tax nor tribute do they give him these are rich the word rich means literally word but when you take a look at the story of the collection of these items what we discover is that when they interviewed the translator and the singers they said is a rich a word yes can a wretch be several words? Oh, yes. Can a wretch be a line? Yes. Can a wretch be several? Up, up to even a short, complete song can be wretch, word. And that's persistence. Now, I there's another aspect. And when we talk about Avdo Medjedjevic, here comes where the excitement of that amazing singer comes in, too. This is a father and son grouping. And I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and play the son first. Okay, so let's take a look at Milan here. And here's Milan's version of the story. And take a look at that story while we're getting ready to listen to Milan just a real briefly and see what's happening. The adorned mountain woman, that's going to be a wretch right there. Okay. But see, it's a, he's drinking wine and they're going to go to combat. Okay. That's Milan's version. Let's come out of Milan's version. And it's not just because he's younger. <laughs> But take a look at his dad's version of the same experience. <laughs> now you see how he's drinking wine and he's going out to combat, but there's a lot more in between. It's the same story but the father has put in embellishments that help us to have visuals that his son didn't include it. He was just, son was getting to the point. What are some of your thoughts on that, that this particular concept of, well, mood we chatted about a little bit here, but also the persistence and embellishment. Any thoughts? for us? Well, the previous one, the one it related to persistence, you know, while I was listening to it, it comes to my mind like if people were like praying and it persistent because of faith, you know, when, because we have faith in something, we are persistent in order to achieve something that we really want. So there is kind of a connection between the singer and let's say and God or any other supernatural force. Ah, neat. Thank you. That's a really interesting parallel right there. Anyone else? Yeah, I was thinking about um, uh, the jazz uh, players. Um, so each performance seems to be, there is a consistency, but there are also a variation. And so I just wonder if the sun and then the father, uh, each 
telling the, according to the occasion, according to the audience, they vary a little. What would they embellish uh, uh, differently? That's neat. I hadn't myself thought about the jazz part, but that's such a cool uh, parallel, Dali. Thank you. Any other comments? Now we'll think about that because we're going to continue to come to this idea of persistence, which brought Milman Pare there, as I say, and the embellishment as we take a look at, now we're gonna turn and we're going to give Homer a little interesting run for his money now, shall we? Okay, we know the word epos, okay? The Greek word epos. And again, I'm gonna go back to Mr. Pearson's comment about the, the uh, water water the water beings uh having things persistent so is that we of course get the word epic the word etymological background of the word is means word epos word this reminds me again of the word rich meaning word the word also means song the linguists um, that are here today, the linguist, linguistics that brings us together, that makes that museum the, the hotbed of fun for people to come and play. This alone, knowing that the word epos both means word and song, and remembering that spoken language is 150,000, pl whatever, plus, versus the written, this tells us right away the nature of what an epic is all about. It is, in fact, of course, song. And it's song, as we know, about heroes and about the history. We've watched this already, the combat, the drinking of wine, the cracking of mountains, and the roaring of the sea. Okay. And one of the things that I think is interesting is to watch how this concept of epic we continue to work with. Here's a ancient frieze, or at least uh, an evocation of it. Here's a more modern one. Uh, do we recognize the characters in this one? Who are Luke. we seeing? I am your father. I am your father. <laughs> Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, the epic of our current generations, okay. Uh, and so we are going to now go to the dictionary definition though, and we're gonna take a little bit closer look for just a moment. Um, we know it's an extended narrative poem. Notice the other keywords here, my friends, we've already basically taken a look at it, but let's reassure ourselves. Heroic tradition, we're not talking about our failures tr traditionally, oral composition, standard formulaic diction, metrical and narrative conventions. And notice that last line, the final version, wait a minute, stop, stop. Don't rush past this one. Homer, watch out, baby. The final version being transcribed after the introduction of writing. Ah, well, with that definition, we got to get rid of Luke and Darth because they're after the introduction of writing. But if I go to the fifth definition, at least in the dictionary my dad used to use, uh, literary or dra dramatic composition, characteristic that way. Okay, so we can bring them back in. We, we're still legitimate. But let's think about the other one. Do not know how many of you had an opportunity to read or, or work with even Adam, because uh, again, the the, the connections that are here today are, I'm just honored that you would be here today and watching this ongoing. In the New Yorker, June 7th of last year, Adam Kirsch wrote, uh, The Classicist Who Killed Homer. And I absolutely adored this picture that was associated with it. So I put it up here. And the review by Adam is a, one of your links if you we're not able to read it, you can read it through that review link, okay? And it, his review was of the book uh, released by Robert Kanaga, Panagel, I don't know his pronunciation of his name, so I'm going to uh, uh, apologize to him through you. 
hearing Homer's song, which is, uh, this is the cover of the book. It is available and is out in about uh, 2021 release. And did you notice, see that the subheading, the brief life and big idea of Milman Pari. And in this review, which so now I'm going to focus on that. In this review, Adam points out quite a few of the items that I had put in my papers, only he wrote beautifully and eruditely about, the, again, this idea of the formula that brought Milman Perry to the Balkans. And here, quoted from Milman Perry's own studies in the epic technique of oral verse making, which is the, from his 1928 writing, please read this quote by Pari himself. The nature of Homeric poetry can be grasped when you see its diction, which is oral and so formulaic and therefore traditional. Next, Pari's concept about, now in this particular review, they often refer to it as epithets. However, I've been using the word that I prefer, frankly, because I believe that it captures for me and I perhaps for you too, the formula, formula. There's verse out of formula can do it no other way. We don't have the thinking time to be able to recreate the story to anchor except through the formula. And again, from Pari, he found that when he asked a Guslar to perform the same poem on consecutive days, they could be dramatically different. And here's that experiment that I already alluded to. With Avdo, he asked him to repeat it. Now, I shared with you that he was able to repeat it, but watch what Pari captured in this next quote. His ornamentation, his adaptation, his visualization, his empathy, that those emotions, that moral sense that Avdo brought, the reason why I provided the quotes earlier on in this presentation, made him go into the humanity that was underlying the story and to em bring embellishments which were true to the concept, created more visuals and provided more impact. And so, here is what's happened in Homeric studies just within now these last several years. Now, right in front of us. Was Homer an individual poet of genius that just wrote this amazing Iliad, Odyssey? So many have said yes. Yes, he was a single individual, but with the Guslar tradition, with the understanding of the formulae, with the understanding of the way that oral works, with the length of time that we have explored together here today, we can understand that those epic histories were probably sung by hundreds, if not thousands of bards. But in Abdo Medjedjevic, Pari glimpsed what might have happened. Here comes an Avdo Medjedjevic, maybe or maybe not, named Homer, who happened to come at the time when transcription of language could be made possible. And now this transcription credited to this person named Homer becomes what we know of as this epic. Both pedestal, and not so much pedestal. We don't know the names of most of them, but we can probably call them Homer. And so as I bring you to think about that, I want to show you again, my dad's village and Divna, 
and Game of Thrones, otherwise known as Dubrovnik. And when you go in the gate to the Stradun, which people know from that show, uh, around this well, every time I went to visit Dubrovnik, and it's just a short bus ride from my dad's village, there is Guslar playing there. And my father grew up in this concept. And you saw that he talked about Divna. When my father wanted to remember his childhood, he went to the tradition of picking out a word, gusle, and thinking about the poetry of what happened with gusle in all his own life and in the life of the Talmatia, which, as he said to me, no longer exists. You remember that I showed you where he talked about the partisans against the German, mighty German Panzers. But my father actually wrote two short pages on his mechanical typewriter in which he continued to talk about the implications. He, that is the Guslar, wrote my father, as if he were telling a story now himself, never connected the equivalency of that event with his own tribe coming to take over the Illyrians. And as he continued to tell the story, my father that is, he ended it this way, but in record short time after the war, produced the spectacle of the old Guslar's woman neighbor joining dozens of other Slavic women in the Frankfurt airport cleaning toilets. He anchored his, his Homeric epic in word, Babe, grandmothers. And he would provide a visual and he would tell the story, not tis true in decasyllabic drones with a gusle, but by anchoring it in rich, by showing the experience, but also the emotional impact of the lives, in this case of grandmothers going to the hills to get the sticks, pasturing. Not understanding modern world. Grandparent, grandmothers, old women coming from the hills, peddling eggs and to try to stay alive while they were at it peddling themselves to his reflection, anchored in the rich, in the formula, the fishing. In this case, there's multiple pages about fishing for sardines, but in this case, duques, fishing by spear for high value fish at night with light. The story he would tell over the dinner table, written out in epic format. <laughs> I included this one because it has a footprint, historically, supposedly some prints. Of course it does. But what my father's story of it is, how it kept them cool as children and how one of his friends fell almost to his death off the end of the ravine. <clears throat> epic storytelling, if you will. And this is one that I share with you because any of you that are listening today, any of you that are watching in the history are my companions in arms because of our language. My father's refugee experience began because yes, his area was being overrun in the war, but one reason why he was defenseless was because in a fit of political despair, my father's father committed suicide, hanging himself on an olive tree. My father doesn't write about that in his collection that you'll see how many of epic 
episodes he has, but he did write this. And this is actually how I found out about his father's history. He had not told me that he sucked his thumb and carried his pillow around the village, which created bullying because to have a suicide meant that you were rejected by your society. My dad made 83 and I've got a bit of a recording a few months before he died of him singing a Guslare song about a beautiful mountain. You don't know my father, I wish you had, but he's starting to cry at the end. That catch was him beginning to cry because he was speaking about the glory of Croatia and the beauty of its mountains. My dad died at 93. So from ancient traditions to modern expressions, from Homer to my dad's Guslar experiences and yours, uh, the epic is still part of our lives. And so uh, if there's anything more that, especially if you'd like to comment, question, either in the chat or especially by unmuting, I'd be grateful to know what's what your reactions are, what your thoughts are, what your experiences are.